All right, folks, here we go with chapter 11.4. We'll take a look at lesson number one here. Uh, taking a look at a new way to calculate delta H. So far, uh, most of our inferences about delta H or enthalpy changes in chemical reactions and so on have come from the calorimeter. So now we're going to take a look at a different way that would uh, avoid the calorimetric, uh, calorimetric process and uh, give us an alternative to solve these ones. And so this idea of delta H really only depends upon the initial state and the final state. If you think about any of the graphs that we've looked at so far or any of the chemical reactions, we've compared the final internal energies of those uh, products that are produced to the initial internal energies of the reactants used to make them. So it didn't matter any sort of intermediate steps or how we got there to do it. It was just final minus initial when we looked at it. So this overall process is just equal to the sum of all of the individual changes that we can have if, for example, something requires multiple individual steps, or two, let's say it's too dangerous to run in a coffee cup calorimeter or any of the stuff we have here. So here we have our alternative, and this is described as Hess's Law, and it's really just a conservation of energy statement. He states that if you add the chemical equations to get a net total equation, so let's say there were three or four different chemical reactions required to get there, then you can also add the enthalpy changes for those to get a net or overall delta H. All right, so take a look at this little picture here. It might not make sense at first, but let's say we're trying to get the answer for the enthalpy change to go from A to D. But let's assume that that chemical reaction is impossible to run in our uh, high school coffee cup calorimeters, or there's some dangerous intermediate products that we don't want to have to do. So let's take a different pathway. Let's take reactant A, turn it into B, turn it into C, and then turn it into D. What Hess says is that the change in enthalpy between A and B plus the change in enthalpy between B and C plus the change in enthalpy between C and D is actually equal to the delta H for A to D. So we can kind of make a comparison to what we might do in, in school. Let's say there's only one door to St. Francis and we all come in the main door. And then of course to leave at the end of the day we all go out the main door which is on the ground floor. Since our internal energies are mostly potential energy, and if we relate it to us moving around the school, potential energy is relative to height, then as we enter the school, we start out with a potential, gravitational potential energy of zero. And then all of us will go to different classes through the day, we'll take different pathways for our lunch, or for our spares, or to go to lab versus going to a classroom. And so what ends up happening is we take various different pathways going up and down various different stairwells throughout the day, walking from classroom to classroom to classroom. But by the end of the day, we all have to leave from the main door, then you finished with a gravitational potential energy of zero. So what Hess's law is saying is regardless of what we did through the day and the various pathways we took, we started and finished at the same position. So, he's just extended that idea to say that if I start and finish at particular positions, the pathway I take to get there is completely and totally irrelevant. So, we can use this for those difficult reactions we talked about or things that wouldn't be applicable to calorimetry. Uh, another analysis for this is the cyclist analogy, and this is one taken from our textbook. Imagine cyclist A here. All right, he's got a starting point, which would be a very large potential uh, energy, if we think about gravitational potential energy. And then there's a finishing point here, let's say it's at sea level, and so he'd have very little potential energy by the time he gets to the bottom. So cyclist A takes the long meandering pathway, and da 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 eventually goes from start to finish. Okay, well he's gone through this change in potential energy. Cyclist B, the daredevil that he is, goes from point A straight down and then finishes at the same finishing point. So he's gone through the same height change and therefore the same change in potential energy. Notice that on this picture it didn't matter the pathway that the cyclist took. They both went from the same original potential energy due to their high position at the top of the mountain 
to a relatively zero or low potential energy as they got to the bottom of the mountain and their finishing point. So the pathway doesn't matter, much like it didn't matter up here to go from A to D directly, or to go A, B, C, and D and look at the sum of those changes. So Hess's law is kind of taking that idea. We could even look at the clumsy cyclist, cyclist C, who just falls off the back of the mountain and ends up at the finishing point. All right, he would still go through that same potential energy change, just more painfully. But ultimately, it does not matter the path that we take. So we can use this to our advantage to solve more difficult or maybe calorim calorimetry inappropriate reactions. So note that summary on page 504 of your textbook. And there's a couple of things that we'll have to do as we're doing this. If a chemical equation is reversed, then you're also changing the sign of your enthalpy. In other words, if I have an exothermic reaction written one way, but I reverse the reaction, then it must be endothermic in the other direction. If I have to double or triple or half the quantities that I see in that reaction, remember what we had said about the amount of methane that we're burning or the amount of matchsticks that we might have related to enthalpy changes. So if I have one matchstick, it produces X amount of energy. If I burn two matchsticks, then I get 2X the amount of energy. So if I have to adjust the proportions in the equation by adding or multiplying, or pardon me, multiplying or dividing by a coefficient, then the enthalpy change is adjusted in the exact same way. Doesn't mean a lot to just read it word for word off the page here. It'll make more sense as we take a look at our first example. So this example for us is given to us uh, on page 504. If you want to see it in more detail there, that's great. Okay. And so in this one here, we have three different equations that we're looking at and three different enthalpies for the uh, reactions we have. We have the combustion of butane reaction. So there's the delta CH, lots of energy released. We have the formation of carbon dioxide, so delta FH gives us almost 400 kilojoules released. And we have the formation of water vapor, which gives off a lot of energy as well in its formation. So it says, what is the standard molar enthalpy for the formation of butane? Remember, formation means to form from your elements. So here is the target or net equation we are trying to come up with. Carbon plus hydrogen gives us methane. And we're trying to solve for its uh, formation enthalpy. Notice how none of these things are a formation reaction. So what we could do is we could manipulate and add these equations together to make this net equation, and this is what they do. Usually the easiest thing to do is put your compounds in first, so that's what they do with this first one. Only one of my equations has butane, but butane's a reactant in equation one. It's a product in the target equation. So what they've done is they've flipped this equation to put butane in. So you'll notice that the formation enthalpy for the reaction now becomes endothermic, and it is an input of 2,600 kilojoules. We then have to get carbon into the equation. There's only one equation here that has elemental carbon. It's a reactant here. It's a reactant on our target. So I don't have to flip the equation, but I need four times the amount. So what I'll do is I will quadruple this equation and quadruple its enthalpy. Then I have to get my hydrogen into the situation. Only one of these equations, again, has elemental hydrogen. There it is. It's a reactant here. It's a reactant in my target equation. So I don't have to flip the reaction. But I do need five moles of it, and I only have two here. So I do need to multiply this by two and a half times, or five over two. So all I've done is increase the amount, and there's two and a half times the enthalpy change. When you go through and look at this, you'll notice that all a whole bunch of things end up canceling out. I have carbon dioxide, four moles of it as a reactant. There's four moles of carbon dioxide as a product. Well, if I form something, carbon dioxide, for example, it gives off 393.5 kilojoules. If I um, <clears throat> decompose it, which is what I have to do here, I must input 393.5. So the enthalpy changes for the formation and decomposition of these compounds would total out to zero. So they can cancel out, much like we did with net ionic equations in Chem 20. You can see that we have five waters being decomposed to make our products. We have 
five moles of water being formed. So the enthalpy changes for these guys get to cancel out of the problem. And then we have four plus two and a half. Sorry about that, guys. All right, that's the dangers of recording videos at school, but uh, here we go, we'll continue on. And so the last thing here we have is two and a half plus another four, so that's seven and a half oxygens. There's seven and a half oxygens on this side, and so all of this just cancels out. And if you take a look at what remains, four carbons, five hydrogens produced one butane. So the sum of these changes should be equal to that net reaction. And so with our multiplications and with our sine flips, we end up with 125.6 kilojoules per mole for the formation of butane. Okay, so that's one that you can take a look at in more detail. It's going to make even more sense as we go through the first example here, taking a look at it as a step-by-step -step process rather than seeing all the cancellations at the same time on the page. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this particular recording. I'm going to start a second video for the two examples that we have here on the remaining two pages for Hess's Law.